الحمد لله الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسوله محمد وآله وأصحابه أجمعين أما بعد فأعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إذ يتلقى المتلقيان عن اليمين وعن الشمال قعيد ما يلفظ من قول إلا لديه رقيب عتيد صدق الله العظيم وقال النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم إن العبد يتكلم بالكلمة ما يتبين فيها يزل بها في النار أبعد ما بين المشرق والمغرب أو كما قال عليه الصلاة والسلام الحمد لله All praises are for Allah عز وجل All praises are for Allah our creator, our nourisher, our sustainer. Allah who continues to bless us, continue to bless our family members, and continue to give us His grace and kindness on the face of the earth. We must recognize all of these things and thank Allah for all the blessings that He has given to us. As Muslims, my dear respected brothers and my dear sisters, we find ourselves living in many different lands. And uh, we find, alhamdulillah, Muslims may be living in places that are known as Islamic countries. The laws there are conducive to the religion of Islam. And they continue to live and abide by a law which if not fully Islam Islamic, it's partially Islamic, which means that it controls their action. There are certain things they are not allowed to do by law because of the fact that it's also Islamic. And by they following the law, it puts them on the right path. So for example, Muslims who live in an Islamic state, an Islamic country, where it is forbidden by law to consume intoxicants, even if a Muslim has that habit and vice, he will not do it because it's against the law of the country. Now when Muslims, we all know as Muslims, we all know that many things are wrong and we all know also there are many things we have to do. But many a time the individual does not find himself in himself the strength and willpower to do it or the strength and willpower to abstain from it. So sometimes the law helps a person in that case. It helps you to do that which is good. And by doing that which is good, you are doing the right thing. So in a state like that, they may be stopping themselves from consuming intoxicant on account of the law of the land. But in reality, it's better for them. They are staying away from something that is prohibited in the Quran and prohibited in the Sunnah of the Prophet So those people who live in any countries like that, they are able to be helped because of the fact that the law helps them. But people like you and I who find ourselves scattered throughout the world, living in, in countries that are not governed by Islamic law, we have to find the strength with our, within our own selves, begging Allah for the help to let us carry on doing the right thing. Because there are many things that we know that they are haram. There are many things that are not visible in Islam. But if a person wants to do it, there is no law to stop him from doing it. He is at his own willpower with respect to the fact that he makes the choice. And whatever choice he makes, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will either bless him for doing that which is good or punish him for taking the choice to do something wrong. But it is his, it is his choice. So in our country here, we do not have an Islamic state. We live, we are in minority. So you do find Muslims consuming intoxicants and Muslims gambling and Muslims becoming zina, fornication, adultery. If they were in an Islamic state, they would not be doing that. And that is good for them because it is not right to do these things. They are haram. But here, where no law stops you from doing that, you are with your own strength and willpower as given to you by Allah to not do these things. And because of the fact that many people do not have that strong Iman and do not have that strong willpower to make a decision and go with it, 
we find that many Muslims living in territories like this, they find themselves caught up with the swing and the wave of the time. In other words, whatever happens to occupy you know, a country at a certain time, whether it is propagated through the media, you know, or it is the talk of a country, Muslims do find themselves getting involved in these things. And it is like it is normal for anybody to do that because we are, let's say, people of the country, citizens, Chinese, as we call it. So if the talk is about politics, most of the people will get caught up in the talks of the politics also. If a person, he is naturally inclined towards a certain party, then he will naturally want to vote that party and will want, naturally want to help that regardless of the fact that that party might be doing things that are wrong because that's the, 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 you know, the trend that occurs in many places. However, you will have Muslims who will be upright. They will look before they talk. They will look before they do. They will say, this is wrong, I can't support that. And we are not supposed to support it. But again, it's the swing and the wave and the trend that is flowing across that people get themselves involved in certain things. And recently there has been something which has been coming across the media, the electronic media, the papers. It has become a talk because of an issue which occurred. And the, that issue connects to you know, freedom of speech and freedom of the journalists and all these different things that we have going on. And you and I, we put on the radio that, is, that occupies a talk show. You, you put on to listen to the news, that is also a part of the news. You see different articles written by people on the papers, you know, on the press that we read every day, speaking for it, against it, etc., etc., and that is it. But the thing about it is that, you know, people of our country um, are concerned now. Can you say this? Can you say that? If you're in a public forum, what you can say and what you cannot say, you know, it all ties into that. Can you be taken to task for something which you said unintentionally without, let's say, a clear will and intent to do it? And it happened. Okay? You know, many different laws will stem from that. And this is why you will always find in passing a bill, you will have a lot of opposition because there are a lot of hypothetical questions that will be asked and connected to that. If that is the case, then in this case, when that happens, what happens? So it goes like that. But my dear respected brothers and my dear sisters, that issue is something for itself where the authorities have to deal with. But what connects uh, to us is to what extent we have total liberty to use our tongue. That is what is important for us. Islam is a comprehensive way of life. And any matter that can affect society, Islam has given an answer for that. It's only for us as Muslims to look at the answer and decide whether we want to go with it or not. You know, we have a, a full way of life, a complete way of life. And that way of life is not connected to approvals given by anybody. Allah has made it a way of life and this is the way we live. This is the things we do. Even if the whole country goes on a certain slant and Islam teaches us that that's wrong. As Muslims, upright Muslims, we know it's wrong. And even if 99% goes that way, we know we will be the 1% to go the opposite direction because we know it's wrong. We know it's wrong. So we wouldn't do it. So this is something that must be connected in all the things we do in this country we have to find out whether it is right or not whether it is good or bad so therefore obviously Muslims would have been given their opinions also and they would have had that well what this is com country is coming to if you can't say you can't speak out the right you can't speak out what you think then what is happening you don't have a voice that's a different issue altogether. Yes, the Quran says speak, but how you speak is the other question. Who do you speak it to and what will be the outcome of your speaking? We have to learn to control our tongues also. So therefore we find that sometimes, you know, you have people who have big positions in the bank and they meet you. You know, it happened, it happened. So when you speak to them, they are non-Muslim. They say, you, you Muslims really follow your religion. Very, very good. You stick to it. So I say, well, what do you say? Why do you say that? They say, because many Muslims who come to me, you know, they are saying, 
they, when they open an account, or when they have an account, they tell me, please don't put the interest in that at all. We don't want the interest. So they are taken aback. Because everybody who comes, they want more interest. They want money coming on the money they have put. So many people, among the other people, when they come, they want more money. But you are telling us you don't want it? What's something wrong with you? You don't want money? So if they, when they ask the question, the Muslim say, because that is unlawful for us. So even though everybody coming to your system will want the extra, we as Muslims know it is unlawful for us to use it, so we don't want it. If you can give an, an account that does not even have interest in it, we will want that, we will prefer that. Because we know the Quran tells us riba and interest usually is totally haram. We want nothing to do with it. We don't want anything more. This 1% or 2%, that, that, we don't want that. So therefore, even though everybody is doing it, the Muslims will find the strength within themselves because they are Muslims to say no to it. And that's the way we ought to behave. If the whole country is moving so, and we know it's wrong, we have to move the opposite direction to the right direction. And we can't allow the dominance of others to cause us to shift and adjust and move in the wrong direction. We can't do that at all. So if everybody, anybody wants to say what they want to say and pour out their heart without understanding the consequences of their speech, let them do that. Islam doesn't teach us that. Islam does not teach us that. Because from the very, very beginning, Muslims understand that every single thing we have, especially the parts of our bodies, it is from Allah. It's a gift from Allah. And so too the tongue is a gift from Allah. It's a very, very great gift of Allah. And we can only understand how great a gift it is, is, it is when we are void of speech. So if we are speaking every day, and tomorrow we get up, we become dumb. Can we live a life like that? Can't live a life like that? Then we'll understand how valuable the tongue is. Because it is the tongue that expresses whatever desires we have. It is the tongue that expresses whatever emotions we have. And that which is known as the tongue is something which has been entrusted to us by Allah because we didn't create it. We didn't make it. As soon as a baby is born, the baby is given a tongue, but there is speech on the tongue. Because people who are dumb do have a tongue, but they don't have speech on the tongue. But they have a tongue. So the tongue is one favor, and the ability to speak is another favor. And Allah has given us the ability to speak. It is so therefore it is a trust that Allah has given to us. And when something is given as a trust, the law regarding that is we have to use it. Use it in a manner that has been dictated by the giver of that. That is what a trust is about. This, is, this masjid is a trust. This masjid here is a trust. A word used for it in Arabic is called waqf. No individual owns this masjid. You can't own it. If people own the land and had given the land from the time they give the land to build a masjid, they are no owners at all again for the masjid. They can't own the land, you can't own the masjid. You may become a mutawalli, a trustee. A trustee does not mean you are the owner. It means that you may be involved in the decision-making process. That if someone wants to come and do A, B, C, D, and E, and sell the land, you could stop them because you are a trustee of the masjid. And this will continue to move in the care of Muslims over the period of time for a hundred, a thousand years. But no man can own it. And it must be used only for the purpose it has been given, nothing else. So tomorrow, if we get a big piece of land there, about five acres over the road, we can't say we'll shut down this masjid and build a bigger masjid with a bigger car park. We can't do that. You know why? This has been given as a house of Allah and will continue to be used like that. Nobody could change that afterwards. Until the day of judgment, that's the meaning of waqf in Islam. Or a trust in Islam. A trust. Doesn't have owners. Allah is the owner of that. And it will continue and must continue with the, the objectives and the purpose that has been, it has been given for. So our body, our tongue is a trust from Allah. Allah is the owner of the tongue. We never made it. 
We never created it. So since Allah is the owner and it is a trust to us, we use it as He has told us to use it. Like the other parts of our bodies. We use it. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made such an intimate connection between the tongue and the brain that as soon as the brain thinks about something, immediately the tongue utters it. Such a close connection that the brain is only thinking to say this and the tongue gives it out. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the controller of every single thing. And He has given it. And He tells us in the Quran that I have given it to you, but I have not given you liberty to use it as you wish. So therefore, I have put two angels. And the purpose of these angels who are on your right and your left, their main purpose is to record, record everything you say and everything you do to let you know that you can't say anything and get away with it. So he says in Surah Al-Qaf in the Holy Quran, أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم He says إذ يتلقياني إذ يتلقى المتلقياني عن اليمين وعن الشمال قعيد Behold when the two receivers receive your actions and your statements and they are sitting one on the right and one on the left the angels, the recording angels they are known as the receivers because they receive our actions and they document it. And what does the other ayah say? Allah says, "Ma yalfizu min qawlin. The man does not utter a single word, not a single word, illa ladayhi raqibun atid, except right there at that moment there is a watcher, there is one ready to record it. As soon as it comes out, immediately it's recorded. So there is no way, according to our teachings from the Qur'an, a man can get away with his actions and statements in the sight of Allah. There is no getting away. Once it comes out, it's documented already. And this book that is being written by the angels, it is the very same book that will be handed to each and every one of us on the day of judgment, which is called the A'mal, the Namai A'mal or Al-Kitab. And when Allah gives it to us, what will Allah say to us? Iqra kitabak, you read your own book. This is what you used to do. And when a man begins to see, he will be asked to read it aloud. And a man begins to see all the wrongs he said and all the wrongs he, he did. It. The man will begin to stutter his tongue. And he will tremble and his tongue will not move. And Allah says, this is your book. Read, this is what you did. Nobody never made this up. There is no forging here. There is no fraud. This is your book. Today, today, this is sufficient as a witness against you because this is what you used to do. So whatever comes out from the tongue, it's immediately recorded. This is why the Prophet ﷺ warned us warned us about the things our tongue will do and he said in the hadith recorded by Imam Bukhari Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala has narrated it he said the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said man kana man kana yu'minu billahi wal yawm al akhir whosoever believes in Allah and the last day whosoever believes in Allah and the last day fal yakul al khair let him speak that which is good or let him be silent. Two things. Choose between two things you want to do. Is either you speak that which is good, and if you do not have anything good to say, then the Prophet says, You be silent. You be silent. And do not allow the tongue to just move and roll as it wishes. Do not let things just run out from the tongue. As if you are throwing water out of a bucket that you are not thinking. Because even if a person unto something and he did not think about it, it will bring about the consequences that have been recorded and mentioned for that. This is why in another hadith Imam Bukhari has recorded from Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Inna la'abda yatakallamu bil kalimati Sometimes a servant says something with the tongue. 
fiha, and he does not even look to see what he said. It just comes out. He does not think about it. He does not think about whether it's good or bad. He does not even think about the consequences of what he said. He just throws it out with the tongue. Fiha. He says, and on account of that, Yazillu bihaf in nar, this that he uttered will throw him into the fire of hell. To what extent? It will throw him so deep in the fire of hell that it will be further than the east and the west in distance. So deep it will throw him in the fire of hell. So the Prophet wasallam, he mentioned to us, be careful of what you say. Be careful of how you say. Think about what you say before you say it. Don't let it run out and then you think about it because then it may have already caused such damage that you can't undo. The Prophet wasallam also mentioned to us and he said that sometimes a man says something. He says a good word and he pays no attention to the good that he has said. But it's good. You know somebody just says something good. And they leave it like that. And they, would, they do not pay any attention. He does not cast any attention towards it. And he does not think about it. But he knew it was good. So he says something good. On account of that, يَرْفَعْهُ اللَّهُ فِي الْجَنَّةِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will raise his status in paradise. He will raise his status in paradise. So it goes to show that if we have to say anything, Without thinking about it, say that which is good because we are in the safe place. We will be in the safe place. When we say something, we don't think about it, say that which is good. Without thinking, say that which is good. Because through it, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will elevate a person in paradise. But in the same note, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, وَإِنَّ الْعَبْدَ لَيَتَكَلَّمْ بِكَلِمَةٍ مِّنْ سَخَطِ اللَّهِ that sometime the servant says something which brings about the displeasure of Allah and he does not pay any attention to what he is uttering. It's, it brings about the pleasure of Allah and he does not even view it as something that is bringing about the displeasure of Allah. You know, he says that small thing, that's light, no problem with that. But it brings about the sakhat of Allah. Yahwi bihi ila jahannam. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, on account of that, he will be thrown in the fire of hell. So therefore, what is evident from these traditions which we have narrated so far, is that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has mentioned about the good of the tongue and the harms of the tongue. And he has clearly mentioned to us that you do not you do not speak things that, that will bring about disaster and destruction to you. You do not do that. You keep it in control. You think about what you are saying. Not because everybody is saying the same thing, you will say the same thing. The Prophet ﷺ said, Kafabil mar'i kathiba, an yuhadditha bi kulli ma samia. It is sufficient for a man to become a liar, to narrate everything he hears. It is sufficient for a man to become a liar, to narrate every single thing he hears. So in other words, it means that you heard something and you narrate it. You heard another thing, you narrate it. You did not even ask if that's the truth. You did not even want to verify that statement, but you continue. The prophet says, in the sight of Allah, you will be al-kathab, a liar. And on the day of resurrection, you will be resurrected as a kathab and a liar. And everybody on the day of judgment will know you as a liar. So he says you have to be careful. And you know, that is something that sometimes we take light. Because you utter something, it causes damage to another person. And when the person becomes offended, you say, well, it's only a small thing. I mean, you're not dead. <laughs> I didn't kill you with that word. But worse than that is done. Worse than that is done with the tongue. This is why famous Arab poet once said, he said, Jarahatu sinani lahul tiyami. Jarahatu sinani lahul tiyami. Wa ma jarahal lisa wa la yaltamu ma jarahal lisanu. He says the, 
the wounds that have been caused by the teeth of a sword the wounds that has that have been caused by the teeth of a sword there is a healing for that you get cut with a knife you go and you put some antiseptic or you put something and you dress it after two or three days or after a week it becomes cured you look at your hand it's probably it's like it never existed so this is clear some knife or something cuts you it's it there is a healing he says he says but the wounds that are caused by the tongue there is no healing for that subhanallah the wounds that are caused by the tongue there is no healing for that because what you say to a person it has such an effect on the person that for 10 years and 20 years and 50 years the person will remember and that which destroy the relationship anytime it's remembered it will continue to destroy relationship how many a time you see people who have not been speaking to each other for many years and when you ask them why and you are telling them make up with so and so you say no 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 for the things that person said to me or about me not me and him again I wouldn't speak but yes the person can come and justify his action by say but I didn't kill you I didn't cut you I didn't take your money what did I do you said so and so probably for you it's light for him it's not light the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was so particular about people saying statements that offended others that in his presence one person uttered it to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam so and so is short look at him he's short the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says stop immediately because what you are saying may offend the person you may be just describing the person but he takes it as something that is offensive you are taking out you are making a mockery out of him because sometimes you can use the word short to describe a person but you can use it also to talk against the person and for you you are making a joke but how the person takes it is very very important the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said you know about ghibat the Holy Quran itself says it's eating the flesh of your brother when you do ghibat and you backbite you are actually eating the flesh of your Muslim brother or anybody you do, you do it to so once he asked the Sahabas if they knew what was ghibat and backbiting because it's, it's, it's grave, it's a grave sin it's a grave sin so they said Allah wa Rasuluhu A'lamu Allah and his messenger knows best the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said it, it is to say something about your brother that when he hears it he will feel offended it is to say something about your brother or anybody else that when that person hears it they become they become offended so you must think now you are saying something if you are to tell the person it will that person be offended well yes if he's offended that's backbiting so the sahaba said oh messenger of allah what about if what we are saying is the truth you know somebody say something you want to polish it up also but it's the truth you know so if it's the truth does it give you the license to say it you have to think whether if it is said to this person will the person be offended or not before you say it and are you ready to say it to the person directly so they said what O Prophet of Allah if what we are saying it is the truth the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says that is exactly backbiting because if you are lying then that's slandering that's another major sin so even though what you are saying it is the truth that is the major sin that is known as backbiting about which Allah says it is eating the flesh of your brother besides the punishment which awaits a person for that in the hereafter and if you say something which is not in that person then you are slandering you are lying and then that's a different punishment that's a, a grave punishment a, a, you know a big punishment a person will get for that because it's a grave sin so the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam warned us be careful even the Holy Quran prohibited us is us from saying words do not call people by nicknames that 
show any type of deficiency in them, any type of problems they have, any type of things that may happen, thing that may happen to them that will bring out a fault or a defect in that person, the Quran says, لا تنابزوا بالالقاب Do not call people by such nicknames. You may call a person by the name of an animal because you think he's like that, but that is offensive. That's totally haram in Islam. You may call a person by a certain color. That is offensive. He doesn't like that. That is haram. You may liken a person to another person who was a wicked person. That is totally haram. You may liken a person to any other thing in your mind. And your main purpose is to be sarcastic. Your main purpose is to make a joke. That is totally haram. This is why the Holy Quran in Surah al hujurat says, وَلَا تَنَابَزُوا بِالْأَلْقَابِ Do not call people by such offensive nicknames. بِعْسَ الْإِسْمُ الْفُسُوقُ بَعْدَ الْإِيمَانِ How evil a thing you will do after you're a Muslim. How can you ever do that? Allah Himself is saying, you're a Muslim and you are still doing it? How evil and wicked you are after having Iman and saying you are Muslim, you are doing that? Allah then says immediately, وَمَنْ لَمْ يَتُبْ Whosoever does not repent for doing that, then he is a wrongdoer in the sight of Allah, transgressor in the sight of Allah, and he will get the punishment for Allah, from Allah. So it is a very, very serious thing. Our tongue, this is why the Prophet ﷺ used a statement which has been recorded by Imam Tirmizi. He says, مَنْ يَغْمَنُ لِي مَا بَيْنَ لِحْيَيْهِ وَمَا بَيْنَ رِجْلَيْهِ أَضْمَنَ لَهُ الْأَضْمَنُ لَهُ الْأَلْجَنَّةِ He says, whosoever can guarantee me that they will take care of and they will put in control the thing that is there between the two jaw bones, that's the tongue, and that which is, which is between the two legs, the private area, then I guarantee them entry into paradise. If you can guarantee me that you will put these things in control, then I will guarantee you paradise. Because when you put these things in control, it means you will be obeying the laws of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You will be a good and true Muslim, then you will get Jannah. One day Abu Bakr held on his, his tongue and he was twisting it. Mu'ta, the Mu'ta of Yom Malik records and he was holding and twisting it. So the people said, oh, Abu Bakr, what are you doing? He says, هَذَا إِنَّ هَذَا أَوْرَدَنِي الْمَوَارِدِ This is the thing that will get me in trouble. This is the thing. So I want to teach you the lesson. In the hadith recorded by Imam Tirmizi also, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, إِذَا أَصْبَحَ إِبْنُ Adam, When the man gets up in the morning, when the man gets up in the morning, all the body, the, all the different parts of the body, look at the tongue. And they say, O oh tongue, اِتَّقِ اللَّهَ فِينَا Fear Allah with regards to us. Huh? What do they say? Abu Sayyid Khudra radiallahu ta'ala is the narrator of the hadith. Says that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, When a man gets up in the morning, all the parts of the body say to the tongue, اِتَّقِلَّهَا فِينَا فَإِنَّمَا نَحْنُ بِكَ Fear Allah with regards to us, because we are all your subordinates. We go in accordance to what you say. The hand says, if you tell me hit, I hit. The hand says to the tongue, if you say, do this, I do it. You are the issue of the commands that come in your heart and your mind. Because the tongue expresses what is in the heart and in the mind. That's the only thing that can express it. So, they say, فَإِنْ إِسْتَقَمْتَ إِسْتَقَمْنَا If you are straight to tongue, we will be straight. If you are straight, we will be straight. وَإِنْ أَعْوَجْتَ and if you go crooked, we will be going crooked also. So we beg you, for our sake, be straight. Because if the tongue has committed wrongs, then the whole body will suffer in Jahannam. This is why the Sahabas one came to the Prophet ﷺ while he was speaking about controlling the tongue and being careful of what you say. They said, أَنْوَاخِذَنَا يَا رَسُولُ اللَّهِ بِأَلْسِنَتِنَا they said, O oh, Prophet of Allah, 
would we be taken to task for what our tongues do? The tongue is saying this, the tongue is saying that, the tongue is saying the next thing, etc. In the hereafter, will Allah take us to, to task for that? The Prophet wasallam said, Hal nasa nari ala wujuhihim illa hasa'iru al sinatihim He says the only reason that men will be thrown headlong into the fire of hell is on account of the tongues because of what the tongues did. That's the only reason. So you may have done good otherwise, but the mischief and the fitna the tongues may have done, that will carry a person in the fire of hell. This is why Uqba bin Amir radiallahu ta'ala in the hadith recorded by Imam Tirmizi, he says that he came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, Man najatu ya Rasulullah, Messenger of Allah, what is the way of salvation? O oh, Prophet of Allah, what is the way of salvation? What is the way out? How can I gain success? How can I gain salvation in the sight of Allah? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam gave him three advice. He said, I'm sick alayka lisanaka. Keep your tongue in control. Keep your tongue in control. Because you know what? It slips. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, A man slips faster by his tongue than his feet. The feet don't slip as fast as the tongue do. The tongue slips a lot. He says, keep your tongue in its control. Have it there. Be careful of what you utter. Think before you speak. Will it bring about problems? Are you backbiting? Are you lying? Are you slandering? Are you using derogatory remarks against another person? Are you ill-speaking another person? Are you disrespecting? Think before you speak. I'm sick. Alayka li sanaka. Keep your tongue in control. Wal yasaruka baituka. And let your house be sufficient for you. Let your house be enough for you. What does it mean? It means take to remaining at home more regular. Don't have yourself out there sprawling about and moving about. Because the more you are on the outside is the more sins you are prone to commit. The more wrong things you may get involved in. The more wrong things you may look at. You will get yourself involved in so many wrong things. So as much as possible, let your house be sufficient for you. You stay there. ala khati'atika And the wrong deeds you have done. And the sinful actions that you have done. In any form and fashion, we it. Cry to Allah and beg Allah to forgive you. Before they reaches when you will not be able to cry for the sins that you have committed. So these are the three advice he has given to Uqba bin Amir. Like, like any one of us, we would also want to know, O oh Prophet of Allah, what is the way of salvation? And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, I'm sick alayka lisanaka. Keep your tongue in control. Let your house be sufficient for you and enough for you. Let it suffice you. And also weep and cry over your misdeeds in the past. So my dear respected brothers and my dear sisters, Islam has given us a way of life. Allah has given us a way of life that tells us what we will be taken to task for what we do. So therefore, in the matter of you know, using our tongues because we feel that we have total liberty and we can use it for whatever and we wouldn't be bothered about how another person feels, Islam says, no, you can't do that. You don't have full freedom. You have a limited freedom. Because Allah tells you, if you do this, then this will be your okay. case. So if you do that, that will be your okay. case. So we have to obey Allah. We have to obey Allah in the matter of what we do with our tongues. And let's not, let, let it should never happen that the things that other people do, it affects us and it pulls us into itself. It should never happen like that also. And so they say, join the club and everybody is saying one thing. We begin to speak the same thing and we begin to behave like other people. Know well that we have a way of life and a religion. Allah has stated in the Quran, we have revealed a sharia for you. Fattabi'aha, follow it. Wala tattabi'a subula. And do not follow all the other pathway, pathways that you see around. If you do that, then you will be misguided and you will fall on the path of astray. So this is a very, very important thing that we need to understand whether it con connects to the country, whether it connects to the people of authority, when it, whether it connects to our own masjid, to our family members. We have to keep our tongues in control and be careful of what we say and how we say it. 
Because nobody except the individual will have to suffer the consequences of the actions that have been done by the tongue. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us strong iman and give us the understanding and give us that strength within ourselves to hold back when we know it's wrong and we have to hold back.